Hello fellow cyborgs and welcome to another zero by 19 update. At this point, we're not gonna get to zero, but that's okay, we're gonna get as low as we can. In these update videos, I tell you about the books that I've recently read, the books I've recently hauled, the current number of my physical TBR, and sometimes what I'm planning on reading next. I think this video is going to be too long, so I think I'm gonna skip that one in this case. So anyway, let's talk about the books that I recently finished. I'm going to start off with poetry plays and then work my way through fiction and nonfiction. This is Haiku, selected and edited by Peter Washington, translated from Japanese by R.H. Blythe. This is part of the Everyman's Pocket Poets collection. That's the word. I gave this three out of five stars. It was actually not as quick of a read as you would have thought, given that these are haikus. My main complaint is I did not like the organization here. I think the organization was really helpful from an academic standpoint. Someone who's going to write a thesis on the use of chrysanthemum in traditional Japanese haiku. For someone who is reading this just leisurely and is reading it from cover to cover like I did, then it ended up being, oh, I get to read six poems about chrysanthemums back to back. Oh, I get to read six poems about the mirror surface surface of a lake back to back. Every subject ended up feeling dull to me because of that back to back nature. But overall, if you're into haiku, I think this is an interesting collection. It does have a butt ton of traditional Japanese haiku, which in my opinion were like very much better quality, even tr in translated form than the English haiku in the back. But then it also has some traditional... English haiku, so you know, the 17 and 1800s, and then more modern haiku. So I enjoyed, but I didn't love. The two plays I read, there was a dud and there was a good one. So let's get the dud out of the way. And of course, by dud, I don't mean like merit as a play. I mean, just Amanda's experience of it was a dud. And that was Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. I listened to an audiobook version of this, which I guess kind of like listening to the play from my local library. I'm so pleased because I could not have gotten through this without it. But when I finished this and I knew that this was kind of, this is one of those more hmm, cerebral plays where you're going to study it. And a lot of really important academics know why this is really important. But again, for me, someone who's reading it for fun, I just did not care. I also like was really put off by two characters that I didn't think were going to be in this play. I thought it was just the two dudes waiting for Godot, but there are other people in here and they were really upsetting. <laughs> so yeah, this ended up being a two-star read for me. It was fine. I didn't get it and I don't think this play was meant for me anyway, so... One that I really enjoyed and gave four stars though, I expected I wouldn't like it, was The Crucible by Arthur Middle. M <laughs> Miller. I had to read this uh, alongside the Scarlet Letter. There is some bad glare. There we go. Alongside the Scarlet Letter in high school. And of course, did I actually read them? No, I didn't. So this was kind of my first time reading this. And I, knowing the subject matter, which just centers around the Salem Witch Trials, which was a um, a metaphor, I guess you could say, it's probably the wrong word, someone will correct me in the comments, for the McCarthy Red Scare in the 50s when this play was actually written. I expected this to be a shouty play with like 12 people on stage at once shouting at each other and I was really not looking forward to it. But instead, this is set up into smaller scenes between just like a handful of individuals at most, so much more readable than I thought and so psychologically terrifying. This and Lois the Witch by Elizabeth Gaskell are two works of fiction that take on the Salem Witch Trials that I've really appreciated. It's just the horror of, oh my goodness, there is, there is no way, there is no way to convince these zealots that I am not in league with the devil. It's kind of like the nightmare of being accidentally imprisoned in a mental asylum. There is nothing you can say to these people to prove that you are sane. It's one of those like, oh, I'm just trapped. So yeah, really, really enjoyed this. Highly recommend you should, you should check it out. 
especially if you're into the Salem Witch Trials, because this is based on a lot more fact than I thought, which was just like bonus points. On to some fiction. There are a lot of three stars in this pile. It's fine. I'll talk about it later. Kenobi by John Jackson Miller is, oh, as you can tell, it's a Star Wars book, guys. I liked this. I gave it three out of five stars. When my mom read this, she read this before me, she said this should not have been called Kenobi, it should have been called Tatooine, and I 100% agree. If you're looking for what did Hermit Kenobi do between the end of episode three and the beginning of episode four, this isn't the book for you because he t he's like one of the side characters in this. This mostly focuses on people, colonists who are already permanently located on Tatooine. There's also this character named Annaline who was annoying. I suspect that had I physically read this and not listened to the audiobook, perhaps she would not have been as annoying for me. But the way the audiobook narrator played her, at times she was a hard ass, no nonsense, kick ass lady. And then when she was around Ben Kenobi, she turned into a fawning 15 year old. Just incredibly wistful and just like the most stereotypical woman sort of sort of thing and i just didn't i didn't believe that that sp split in how she w interacted with the world it frustrated me so this was fun i also really liked learning more about the tuscan raiders that was really interesting and upsetting but yeah i mean this this was fine it was fine it was a three star star wars books not one of the best timothy zahn and his Thrawn trilogy is by far the most excellent Star Wars book I've ever read, Star Wars series. But anyway, it was, yeah, it was, it was good. It was fine. The Bird's Nest by Shirley Jackson I buddy read with Acacia Ives early in November. And this also got three out of five stars. And I think that's totally fine though. I feel like Shirley Jackson will never be a five star author for me, but I still want to read everything that she's written. It's one of those weird author places to be for me, but I accept. This just didn't live up to The Haunting of Hill House. And I'm wondering now, if anything will live up to The Haunting of Hill House, which happened to be the first Jackson that I read. It's possible that my first Jackson, whatever it was, was always going to wow me and everything else was going to fall a little short. I chatted with Acacia about it and it is a pretty darn accurate, for the time it was written, study in a certain mental illness that I think think, well, if you read the back of this book, you know, but if you want to go in blind, then I just won't say it. it. It's probably on the back of editions. But anyway, so it's a really commonly misrepresented mental illness in fiction, both in book form and in movies and television. And this book pretty much nailed it. I did find though that, so each chapter, they're quite long chapters, are from different points of view. And the points of view from Dr. Wright were just kind of gross because this is a mental health care professional and he is clearly not unbiased. He is clearly biased and it's just kind of like, oh, you should, you shouldn't have patience. You shouldn't be a doctor. He got more annoying uh, as the book progressed and it was just like, go away. You're not doing it right. Go away. Overall, I liked it. So that is a good thing. And I will be reading a butt ton more Jackson in the future because she's, she's, she's pretty awesome. Then I finally read one of the remaining nonfictions on my shelves, Hustlers, Harlots, and Heroes, a Regency and Steampunk Field Guide. I almost nailed it by Krista D. Ball. This this is a nonfiction geared toward writer's guide to the Regency and Victorian and early Edwardian, not so much, eras, and just kind of giving you a big, broad overview of what is historically accurate to include in your potential novel and what would be completely not good to it to include and just kind of giving you a really basic and rough understanding of the Regency and Victorian era and what was going on and what you could conceivably add in. This book was really cute. It had illustrations and like mini biographies before every chapter. It also has little like tidbits where it's like this is an ancient, not ancient, but a Victorian recipe for well, these are grocery bills and giving you the amounts of money people spend on food. Each chapter is split into a different sort of zone. So one will be on food. One is on the servants of the, you know, the lower class servants. One is on prostitution. One is on race and slavery and emancipation. If you are looking for a down and dirty Regency and Victorian era history and just giving you a good overview of the, the time period, and especially if you're thinking about writing in those time periods, 
I highly recommend. I gave this four out of five stars. It was a lot of fun and it set out, it did what it set out to do 100%. Now we have some Steinbeck to talk about. It wasn't great. To a god unknown, I buddy read with Sarai from Sarai Talks Books, and thank goodness I had a buddy to read it with because this was weird. On my Goodreads review, I am calling this the creepy Steinbeck book because this is fable-esque to the point where the writing is so detached and the, the people in the story are so not individual people that putting some creepy mood music on when you're reading this will turn every scene a little bit sinister. So this basically follows Joseph as he sets up a farm in California and his family's there. And then there's a big oak tree on the property and he thinks that his dead father's spirit is in the oak tree and that clashes with his really religious brother and and it's and then there's animal sacrifices and a rock that kills people and murder and the satanic goat cloud. It goes places, guys, that I didn't think it was going to go. So I enjoyed this. I gave it three out of five stars, but but only when I started thinking of this as like Steinbeck doing horror. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why this exists really, but that's okay. So to a god unknown. I don't, I, it's unknown why this book exists. I also finished Journal of a Novel, The East of Eden Letters. These are the little notes that he, well, some of them aren't little, notes that he wrote, John Steinbeck wrote to his editor, Pat, when he sat down to write East of Eden. So he'd warm up with a little note to Pat and then he'd go into writing East of Eden. I would recommend that people who are Steinbeck fanatics would get a lot out of this. If someone desperately loves East of Eden and wants to know every single little thing about it, if someone wants kind of a snapshot, like look at Steinbeck's life and how a master craftsman writes the best book, because this isn't just like, this is how authors do things. This was Steinbeck, like at his prime, he was writing, in my opinion, his greatest work. And for him, this experience was easy and just flowed and it just worked and he knew what was going on. And as someone who at one point wanted to be a writer, it was so depressing to read because it was like, that was not my experience at all. It was like pulling teeth with tweezers. So if any of those things that I previously listed off apply to you, read this. But I think that if you're just casually into Steinbeck, I don't know that this will be super super for you. There were a couple paragraphs where I was like, geez, Louise Steinbeck, like you're this is just a note to a bud and you came out with this. This is awesome. But for the most part, it was like, cool, John. <laughs> so yeah, that's Journal of a Novel. And then I read Grapes of Wrath. Well, I was reading, I actually finished this before Journal of a Novel, but timey why me, it doesn't matter. I buddy read this with one of my friends and I'm really glad that I buddy read it with someone because again, it's like, get your TVR down, Amanda. So Grapes of Wrath, this is the one that a lot of people have to read in school if they're not reading of my cement or maybe you have to do both. I would have just had utter contempt for this if I had to read it in school, but fortunately I did not. I mean, chapter four is all about it, roadside tortoise. So, and this also, I mean, the ending, this is not gonna be a super spoiler, I'm just, but super abrupt. It was just like, and done. And it was like, oh, we are? Cause I feel like there are 17 unfinished stories here, Mr. Steinbeck. But okay, we can be done. So John Steinbeck, I keep, we're not on a first name basis, Amanda. You can't keep calling him John. He was a journalist and he followed and, and talked to Dust Bowl migrant families when these farms were being taken out of the hands of sharecroppers and they were left destitute and they migrated to California because pamphlets filled with lies said that they needed workers. But then when they got there, they were paid like super, super awful, awful, awfully low wages because there were so many of them who were desperate. It was just bad. It was just bad. What Steinbeck succeeded in doing was humanizing the migrant workers because the sorts of feelings that the non-migrant people had for the migrants in this story is akin to what some people, some white people think about immigrants 
especially ones that are of a different color. So that was really good to read that it was like, oh, this is how hatred and disgust and dehumanizing people happens. I understand Steinbeck. So he's taking that power back and he's humanizing these people and he's saying, this happened to them. Don't condemn them. Look at how poopy their life is. They're trying really hard. I like that. If I, if that was his intent, which I think it was, he totally succeeded. Also, I think that these in here are some of the best female characters that Steinbeck has ever written because that is definitely something that I will not give Steinbeck credit for, his female characters. A lot of them are prostitutes, guys. So yeah, I liked it. I, I liked it. I liked it. And I liked it a heck of a lot more than I thought I would. I thought I would hate this. I thought I wouldn't be able to finish it. But you know, it's not East of Eden. This isn't a little nugget of a story that has a beginning, a middle and end. It's, it's just, it's just there. It's just there. The Jodes are there and they're Joding around. So recommend? Read East of Eden, guys. Okay, then I just today finished an audiobook. Do I remember the author's name? Nope. I'm gonna look that up. I'm thinking it's Winston Graham. Let's see if I'm right, guys. Let's see if I am right. Going to the thing. Oh, look at it. I am so good. Totally did it. Okay, so the audiobook is Ross Poldark by Winston Graham. I read this because I had a friend who needed to read it and I was like, I'll do the thing with you. I liked this. I gave it three out of five stars simply because I wasn't like super excited to, to listen to it every single time I sat down to listen to it. But this is probably the number one historical fiction book that I've read that has taken place like as far back as it. This is in the 1700s. And most of the classics and historical fiction that I've read are like Victorian Regency era. So this is probably as like far back in time that I've read. I also really liked, I really appreciated how Graham was realistic in how gross it was to live back there. I mean, they talk about lice a lot because it was a thing. So, okay, it's called Ross Poldark, guys, but he's just one of the, like, ensemble characters, which confused me a lot. But after a while, it was like, okay, I accept that this is how this story is going to go. Demelza's cool. She was cool. I was a little bit like, oh, really? At a certain point in the plot, which I think you guys will understand uh, if you've read it. But then I was like, Amanda, time period, Amanda, time period, Amanda, time period, it's fine. I got over it. And when I finished it, I was like, do I want to just jump into the next one? Do I want to do that right now? I decided no, but I've put it on my Libro FM wish list in the future because yeah, it was, it was good. It was good. Yeah, I didn't really have very many expectations apart from, oh, everybody is reading it just because the TV show came out on the BBC and I wish people would read books because the books are not TV show. So yeah, I liked it. I would recommend, I think it was really quality historical, historical fiction. It just didn't knock my socks off, but that's okay. Some, not every book is going to do that. The last book I want to talk to you about is the only book that I have hauled since I last talked to you and that's Rolling in the Deep by Mira Grant. This is a... Killer Mermaid horror novella. This novella predates her novel Into the Drowning Deep, which I really want to read. And I have been binge listening. I've listened to every single episode now of the Books in the Freezer podcast, which I will link down below and insert a little thing up here if I remember. It's awesome, guys. Even if you don't read horror books, like this is just a good it's a really good podcast. I was just getting like more and more pumped to like eventually read Into the Drowning Deep because how can I say no to Killer Mermaids? And I was like, wait, wait they have, there's a novella? There's a prequel novella? Like I will read the poop out of that. And my libraries didn't have it and I couldn't find it in physical form. So I bought it from Amazon. I feel kind of gross about it, but I'm also forgiving myself slowly every day. So I gave this four out of five stars, guys. This was really satisfying. And I think the most satisfying thing about it was that Mira Grant just seamlessly and effortlessly had a diverse and inclusive cast. It was just like, oh, this is how you write not just straight white people. Amazing! That was just like a bonus. I also loved how this book got into the science of the mermaids. Not too much, but just enough for me to go, hey, 
I like science. Is it true? Uh, we don't know, but that's what I felt in the moment. The ending was kind of abrupt, but I accept that this is a novella and I'm hoping that it was abrupt because like reveals will happen in the novel and it makes me even more excited to pick up Into the Drowning Deep sometime soon in 2019. So yes, I mean, who doesn't need killer mermaids in their lives, am I right? So those are the books that I've recently read and hadn't previously talked to you about. As I said, I only hauled Rolling in the Deep, is that the title? It is. And that wasn't even a physical book and I read it immediately, which I felt good about, and it was super enjoyable too. So. Yeah, my physical TBR shelf right now is at 32, which is pretty good. It was, it's pretty, it's pretty good, guys. I mean, I think my physical TBR was like at, I think I told you it was 104, but it was actually 111. So, oh, have I forgotten? I think I forgot to put two on there. Maybe it's 34. I think it might actually be 34. But that, but those are Christmas gifts, which I'm not including in, maybe I am. I don't know what's going on anymore, guys. So we'll see. I looked at my shelves and I was like, and I, and I made myself count how many books I was 100% not getting to before the beginning of January. And that's 18. So between now and the end of December, not counting Christmas acquisitions, I will have potentially 18 to 32, no, yes, somewhere between 18 and 32 books left on my physical TBR at the end of 2018. I'm pretty happy with that. I'm pretty happy with that. I'm not gonna qualify that, I'm happy. So this next month, December, is going to be Amanda, you get this poop done. You have one month left, see how many you can do, read the little things, nobody's judging, audiobook the crap out of things and also enjoy yourself. And the light, I feel the light at the end of the tunnel, guys. It's a sea breeze. It's just glorious. And I'm so excited that my shelves no longer feel as burdensome to me. And I'm really super excited to read some new stuff and talk to you about my 2019 goals. And mm -hmm. 2019, hopefully it's going to be a banner year. I'm really excited. Let me know if there are any bookish podcasts that you have been listened to lately. Please check out Books in the Freezer. Once again, it is really, really good and will make you want to read horror books. And until next time, continue to be lovely.